Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling now our study through the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. I mentioned the fact that it's the deathbed edition because that will be significant now as we turn to Song of Myself, passage number two. Now the assumption uh, right away is that you have your own copy of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. I hope that that's what's happening for you and that you've been studying with me through these talks with Walt there at learnstrong.net down that left hand side you'll find the folder and the playlist and my hope is that you've been working with us from the very beginning all 24 poems of inscriptions all 19 sections of starting from Pomenoc the introductory comments for Song of Myself as well as passage number one that we just finished so that as you turn now to passage two and my assumption is you've already started to kind of flip through all of the sections, the 52 sections of Song of Myself. You'll notice already that some of these sections are quite longer. For example, you'll see it with this one. When we get to passage 33, you'll really be blown away by the length of the section. Now, I said before that when we were studying the inscription stuff and we were working through the 19 sections of Pomenoc, that one of the things we were doing, and I think this is intentional on the part of Whitman, is that we were learning how to read longer sections, but trying to see how they all kind of fit together, if you will. So I'm really hoping here that we can work through this quickly, but I have to be honest, I'm not going to rush through these sections, okay? I will give as much energy and time as I can to it. Now let's say it out loud to the scholars who are Whitman scholars, of course, our work here is sophomoric, it is epidermal. There's no question about that. We are here to introduce you to a study of Whitman and Song of Myself, in this case, Passage 2. I wish that we could obviously spend more time and go into more depth. Obviously, we don't have the time, so we'll jump right into it now as we get ready to pay attention now to the Passage 2 of Song of Myself. And right away, I wanna, I'm not going to do this all the time, guys, but I will point out that I really do hope that you have a actual copy of the 1855 edition of Song of Myself so that you can begin to dance back and forth between the deathbed edition and the, uh, the original version. Now, the, so many of these poems went through multiple processes and scholars love to spend time doing that. I'll just make two observations real quickly. If you pick up passage two of Song of Myself in the 1855 edition, one of the things right away you notice, and you will have noticed it as well in section one, is the use of the ellipse. You're going to see those dot, 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 dot thing going on. You will not see much of that at all in the deathbed edition. The other thing that's interesting is that you'll have what we learned about from our study of the inscriptions as well as from starting from Pomenoc, what we call those elided verbs. That is to say, those verbs where you're going to have, instead of an ED often, for example, you're going to have the E dropped and you're simply going to have that little apostrophe there. You're going to see that obviously in passage two. You do not see that, and I'll point out the couple of moments when it's most obvious, you do not see that in the 1855. Now what was happening, well as we've said in our study of inscriptions in Pomenoc, Whitman was trying to capture, much like Twain, much of the diction and the vernacular diction of the American population as populous as we were beginning to linguistically uh, develop and the way that we would speak our English here in America. And so there's a very American kind of quality to those elided verbs. Finally, let's go ahead and say out loud what you already know if you've been studying with me from the very beginning of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. Whitman loves to play around with word pictures, metaphors, and right away we're going to play around with houses, rooms, shelves, and perfumes. So right away we're just going to start making interesting observations about the ways in which he played this game earlier in our study, and now we're coming to it again. Now I normally love to read the entire section and then come back to exegete, but when we meet these really longer sections, I'll just go ahead and kind of take it in parts or lines or sometimes even words as you know I love to be able to point out for you the multiple ways that you can read these lines and again my hope one more time I'll say it and then I'll pretty much leave it alone for the rest of song of myself my hope is that you're working on your own with this information and then coming to me as a 
you know, as a helper. And he'll, he'll use the word filter later in this poem. By the way, this is a, a, one of the examples of Whitman as pedagogue, Whitman as teacher, Whitman as instructor. I've said that earlier. I'll say it now definitively. I really do believe this is the best way to read Walt Whitman. He began hating school in many ways and the struggle of school. He had an elementary education. He was self-taught. By 17, he is a teacher in small classrooms all over the area of Long Island, all over the place. I mean, he, had, he was in and out of schools all the time. There's a great story that a biographer tells that a bunch of school board members came out to the school and they saw Whitman out there in the fields laying in the grass with his students. They were all muddy. And when asked why, he said, oh, we were earlier looking for frogs. Now we're looking for bugs. And the question was, we just bought you brand new books with all of these beautiful drawings of frogs and bugs. Why aren't you inside the classroom looking at the books we bought for you? And Whitman apparently reported that I, why would I have them look at a book to see something that we can see firsthand? Now that notion of that firsthand experience, what we will call experiential learning, is central to, I believe, all of Leaves of Grass and certainly a passage like number two. He begins, Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. By the way, just hear the, hear the sound that's quite brilliant there, right? Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. Can we just point out that obviously perfumes are something you smell. Can we point out that all five of these senses are going to be elicited here? And can we please point out that perfumes will be for us somehow a representation of other individual selves? And he says, houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. Now this will take us with this shelves thing. Back, of course, we're going to reference this little poem a number of times from inscriptions. Go back and look at what we had to say about it. Shut not your doors. Do you remember this one? Shut not your doors from the inscription section. Shut not your doors to me, proud libraries, for that which was lacking on your well-filled shelves, yet needed most I bring. From forth the war emerging, a book I've made. The words of my book, nothing, the drift of it, everything. A book separate, not linked with the rest, nor felt by the intellect, but you, ye untold latencies, will thrill to every page. Now, that was early on in inscriptions. Here we're going to come back to an image like this. A little bit later, we're going to hear this word echoes. And we're going to point out what we said in our study of inscriptions and Palmanach. Love that idea that I'm going to say something and then I'm going to return to it. Then I'm going to return to it again. Then I'm going to return to it again. That, we, that, that word echoes will come to mind. and obviously makes us think of our T.S. Eliot and Bert Norton. My words echo thus in your mind. Right? Let's go ahead and keep going. I breathe the fragrance myself and know it and like it. The distillation would intoxicate taking us back up to earlier in part one when he says, uh, retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, right? The creeds and schools and abeyance. The distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. In other words, put it in your notes now. This is going to sound a whole lot like Emerson's self-reliance. I need to be my own person. I need to be my own student. I need to smell my own perfume. I'm aware that there's others with perfume out there. I'm aware of others and their ideas. I've got to I've got to be my own person. This individuality that's so central to our reading of Whitman and Leaves of Grass as of course Whitman as politician as lover of democracy, right? Then he continues. By the way, that word intoxicates a huge word, right? He says I want to get drunk, sounding very much like Keats's uh, 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 Ode to a Nightingale. We've given full lectures on that uh, at LearnStrong.net. I want to get drunk. I want to be intoxicated, but on my own, on my own, not, not with the help of others, right? He then talks about the atmosphere, think nature here, is not a perfume. It has no taste of the distillation, raw, that is. It is odorless. In other words, direct experience of nature unfiltered. I can experience it on my own. Remember what Wordsworth, and there's a whole lot of Wordsworth in this poem, right? Now, remember what Wordsworth says in Tenturn Abbey about what he was like when he was young, like a row he came up on the mountains, bounding over the mountain streams, right? Uh, it, it's, it's as if when you're a child, you don't have to have so much of an, ex, an explanation of what's going on. Children don't go to the park and say, I'm having fun, I'm having fun. 
That's what a par adults who are at the park, looking at them will say, wow, this is so much fun to see them having fun. Children don't say, I'm having fun, I'm having fun. Why? Because for them, the direct experience of Scooby Snacks, they don't need to be told Scooby Snacks are fun. Once you know Scooby Snacks are fun, they're an illusion, as we love to say in 303, right? The atmosphere is not a perfume, has no taste of the distillation, it is odorless. It is for my mouth forever. I'm in love with it. In other words, I love direct contact. This will sound very much like Thoreau's Walden. We're going to come back to Thoreau and Walden here in a bit. It's for my mouth forever. I'm in love with it. Notice the amphoria that we're going to see this, this repetition of the word I. We're going to see several of these examples here in passage two. I will go to the bank by the wood. Now already, there has been some controversial lines in Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself, from the 1855 edition, right? Remember what we said. You opened literally the cover of the 1855 edition and you just started reading words. There was no numbering of sections. There was none of that. And you get to the lines that we're about to read and you can understand why some people, they could not, can I use the word from the first uh, part? They couldn't hazard it. They just couldn't do it. They couldn't tolerate it. They were like, what in heaven's name am I reading? We'll go to work. I will go to the bank by the wood, now here obviously bank of river or whatever, and become undisguised and naked. So in other words, I mean already, you could have, in 1855, it's kind of radical. In other words, I'm going to go to the woods, I'm going to go swimming in the river and naked. Okay, we're going to come back to this image of swimming naked later. Okay, notice the word undisguised, which is beautiful because he says, I'm going to be undisguised. Whitman constantly, and the, and, and the greatest, I believe, the greatest critiquer of them all for uh, Whitman and, and Leaves of Grass and especially Song of Myself, especially for my interpretation is Harold Bloom. It, it's, it's wonderful, Bloom points out the ways in which Whitman's constantly saying, hey, 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 let me give full disclosure and tell you who I really am, and he never gets around to actually doing it. It's brilliant the way he does this. I'm telling you the truth uh, in a little bit. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to get there. Here he says, I'm going to go and become undisguised. No more masks, no more personae, and I'm going to be naked, exposed, right? I am mad. We're back to this ecstasy idea again. I am mad for it to be in contact with me. Now this word contact, later it will be adhesiveness. We mentioned it many times already in our study. There's got to be some kind of connection. And he says, I'm so excited for that. Let's go. Then he will begin to talk about what's going to happen in the woods when he's naked. The smoke of my own breath. And again, obviously, you can read this quite literally, right? I mean, especially if it's chilly in the morning. By the way, notice the repetition of the word the. We're going to get about five or more of these right in a row. The smoke of my own breath, by the way, point out that we've gone from perfume to breath. And this will make sense because later we're going to talk about the perfume and the, the lovely smell of armpits. As I have said in earlier lectures, there is nothing, and I underline the word nothing in my notes, nothing off limits for Whitman. Dude, he will write about every body part, and he will write about every body part. And it will be kind of shocking. I mean, we're going to get to some of this now. The smoke of my own breath, echoes, ripples, buzzed whispers, notice the sounds here, Love root, silk thread, crotch and vine, my respiration and inspiration, the beating of my heart, the passing of blood and air through my lungs. Let's just pause for a moment and just point out the word echoes is brilliant here because it, it does tell us exactly the reverberations, we might want to say, back and forth again and again. Many have pointed out this is central to reading leaves of grass, which is why it was so difficult in 1855 to pick it up and read it, because he'll hit something, go away from it, come back to it, go away from it, so there's these echoes. Now, of course, ripples will give us the effect of the river, right? The buzzed whispers will make us think of bees, and immediately we think of Virgil, of course, when we start thinking about bees and his, and his gorgeous, as well as, of course, um, Thoreau and his discussions of bees. Whispered, uh, buzzed whispers, Love root, by the way, this love root and this silk thread, notice they're hyphenated in your version of the deathbed edition. They were one word when uh, Whitman published this poem for the first time in 55. Love root was just one word put together. It's like he's inventing words, right? Love root, silk thread, and then he'll say crotch and vine. Now, the minute that he uses the word crotch, because earlier it was naked, 
everything starts to become anatomical all of a sudden in Whitman's Leaves of Grass. But then you remember, oh yeah, when you talk about a tree, the fork of the tree is its crotch. And immediately you go, oh yeah, there's multiple renderings of this word crotch because he uses the word vine to follow it up. But of course, crotch and vine can also have, and obviously did have, sexual or it, it, you know, kind of meanings. And anybody that wants to pick up leaves of grass and start to read it from a sexual pers uh, perspective certainly can do that. No question about it. It's beautifully poetic as he plays the game. You almost get the sense that he was smiling the whole time he was playing this game. And, of course, the joy that came with that smiling. My, he says, Lo he, loves he loves to do this kind of thing. You're going to see this all the way through leaves of grass, certainly through Song of Myself. My respiration and inspiration. Notice the repetition of, of Shun, and, and it works so beautifully. My respiration, my breathing, and inspiration, I, I'm inspired when I'm in the, in the woods in direct contact with nature. The beating of my heart, we've heard this beating before, and of course when we get to drum taps we'll understand how much the beating of drums had to do with, of course, the way Whitman saw the world. The passing of blood and air through my lungs, the genius, of course, of the ways in which he'll talk, literally anatomically, but then metaphorically as well. That is to say, the words become the air and the blood of Whitman's life as well, right? And then notice the sniff, again, all the senses here, the sniff of green leaves and dry leaves. Now, uh, now immediately, uh, uh, the, uh, again, these echoes come back, right? And for those of you that have been with us all the way up to this point, you go, wait, wait, wait. He's done this before where he plays around with this word leaves. And you're absolutely right. In Pominock, we saw it in both passage 4 as well as 14. Go back and re read that again and go back in, in, into our study of that. And you'll go, hmm, very interesting. Of course, hello, it is called leaves of grass after all. And we pointed out in our intro lectures the multiplicity of ways that leaves gets used here, right? Notice we got green leaves, we got dry leaves. Okay, dead leaves. And we immediately think of a line like, you know, from Sailing to Byzantium, Yates is an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a leaf. And we think about that word paltry and the ways in which it's like a dried up leaf, right? And of the shore and dark colored sea rocks, we'll immediately think of T.S. Eliot's Dry Salvages here. I have made the argument before that if you're really going to do that study with me at LearnStrong.net with four quartets, Especially a text like Dry Salvages, although notice I already mentioned Burt Norton, my words echo thus in your mind, but to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bull breeze, I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden, shall we follow? Quick set the bird, find them, find them. I mean, you can't read T.S. Eliot, I believe, without having a real firm grasp of what's going on in Leaves of Grass, and here we'll, we'll kind of see it again, right? The sea rocks, and of hay in the barn, the sound of the, this is awesome, Belched words, notice your elided uh, uh, word, verb here. Belched words of my voice, loosed to the eddies of the wind. And eddies, of course, normally is associated with water. This bringing together of air and water, it is obviously pre-Socratic. It's brilliant that the way he does this. Obviously, there's a lot of Heraclitus in this, who, by the way, did say, right, you can't step into the same river twice. Then he goes very interesting to this more sexual kind of language. A few, notice how he uses the word few here. A few light kisses, a few embraces, a reaching around of arms. Wait a minute. He said he was going to the woods alone because he wanted to be alone with his own perfume. And now all of a sudden he's got reaching around. What exactly is it that's going on here? Notice how this kind of poetry will make one stop and begin to look back and go, wait a minute, how did we get here to kissing and, and, and holding and embracing? And then we go, oh, he's playing the game of Emerson in Nature, that essay that we lectured at LearnStrong.net. He's playing a very interesting metaphoric game. When one comes into contact with nature, it can be a form of lovemaking if it's understood correctly. Now that, of course, to us today, I mean, we've even, got the, we've even got the term usually used pejorative of tree hugger. But in 1855, this kind of thing was quite radical. It's like, what in heaven's name is he way over the line with his nakedness, his crotches and his vines, and now all of a sudden we're doing a few kisses that are light, right? And a few embraces are reaching around of arms. Notice he continues, and he's having joy. I mean, he's having such fun. I love to teach. 
and share with you leaves of grass because I can't do it without a certain kind of joy. Although obviously, as we said, there is, you know, there's those moments like passage 16 from Pominock where we kind of, we have the air taken out of our sails. But then we come back and we realize, oh yeah, there's a lot of play as well, isn't there? He says it, the play of shine and shade on the trees. Notice all of our heart siblings S sounds, right? Shine and shade on the trees as the supple boughs wag. This is so much fun to read out loud. I hope that you take time to do this kind of thing. And hello, if you have children in your life and you take them to the park to swing them, what else are you going to do other than read leaves of grass out loud for them in random lines, right? Notice the boughs that wag. And of course, wag is a wonderful word, just like belched is a wonderful word, right? The delight, and then he uses the word alone or in the rush of the streets, or along the fields and, hill, and hillsides. Immediately we have to think about Yeats's in, Lake Isle of Innsfree, I will arise now and go. And remember, there are bees that are a part of, a, a part of that one. And as well, we'll think about Thoreau's Walden, but we'll come back to that one, right? The feeling of health. Before, in part one, it was perfect health. Now it's the feeling of health. The full noon trill. Notice the hyphen, full noon trill. The song of me, we're back to singing, rising from the bed and meeting the sun. Now, I have to pause here, pick up my Thoreau. Of course, we've given full lectures on Thoreau's Walden, but I have to come back to the where I lived and what I lived for lines. Do you remember this? The Vedas say all intelligence is awake with the morning. Poetry and art, the fairest and most memorable of the actions of men, date from such an hour. To him whose elastic and vigorous thought keeps pace with the sun, the day is a perpetual morning. It matters not what the clocks say or the attitudes and labors of men. Morning is what I'm awake, and there is a dawn in me. I mean, come on. Thoreau is a contemporary with Whitman, and they're both contemporaries with Emerson and Emily Dickinson. What an amazing, amazing time. And we've not even mentioned Hawthorne and Longfellow. What, what an amazing time, right? Moral